Shirley Manson, the lead singer of Garbage, joins me in Studio Q. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, so first off, tell me about the decision to embark on this tour, to celebrate this album with an anniversary. Well, I think we just got to a point as a band that we thought it would be really pretty sad if we didn't recognize what we've accomplished as a band. You know, mm. I don't think any of us, I know for a fact, none of us expected to still be around 20 years later. So um, we decided we were in the studio making our new record and we thought we would take a few weeks to just mark the occasion and... That's what we did. Is that a difficult decision for for you in in terms of allowing yourself to celebrate something? <laughs> it is a little actually. Yeah, as just because your band doesn't strike me as a sentimental type. We're not sentimental yeah. at all, nor are we nostalgic particularly. I mean, we always feel like where we're at right now is the best place to be, hmm. you know. But we have really good feelings towards that first record, and it changed our lives and. I think it was just an important decision to make. And once we made it, we got excited. It was something to look forward to. Do you remember the last time before preparing for this tour that you allowed yourself to listen to that album front to back? I have never listened to that record since we made it, if the truth be told. I really Mm. haven't. Um, It's just not, again, my style. Um, I think it's dangerous to live in the past, you know. So it was only when we came to rehearsal about eight weeks ago that um, I listened to the songs for the first time. What was that like? It was really trippy, really freaky. um, But it was cool because I was like, this is a really good sounding record. I was proud of it. And that's a nice sort of way to feel about your debut. I've read you say that you've only recently allowed yourself to feel proud Mm. about that record. Why? I don't know. You know, I think partly it's the Scottish psyche. If you knew anything about the Scots, you know, if if you are even remotely confident in our society, you generally get a good slapping most of the time. We have a similar thing here. Yeah. 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 Well, I think the Canadians and the Scots are quite similar that way. Um, And so I think it was partly Scottish mentality in my case and probably a little of that Northern Hemisphere exists. Well, I know it does in in my band too. They're all from that Northern Hemisphere where we are Mm -hmm. made to sort of not get our heads above our stations kind of thing. Um, yeah. And I also suffered from crippling self-doubt and, and self-worth as, as, a, you know, as a, a young woman. And you've only started to heal from that more? Uh... Yeah, I guess so. I mean, over the last decade, I'd say that I've become an adult. I've matured. I mean, I definitely, I think a lot of musicians, where we have sort of... We're cut off at the knees to a certain degree. We don't really mature, particularly if you enjoy success. You know, if you have any kind of se- success whatsoever as a band, that is a kiss of death to your maturity. <laughs> <laughs> you definitely get enabled. You get enabled. Yeah. Yeah. And you have so many people there to help you do things. And, you know, it's just only natural. You get lazy and you're thinking, well, if somebody's offering to go and get me a coffee, sure, I'd love a coffee, you know. And then before you know it, your entire life is run by other people. I mean, it's really, Hmm. it's it's weird. It's not healthy. It's bizarre. Yeah. Uh, Although nice. Although also nice. Although also nice. (laughs) Um, So then how does it feel to be singing these songs now, uh, 20 years removed with this new, new perspective? It feels good. It feels intense. You know, I mean, one of the things we've all noticed on this tour is looking out into the audience and you see people crying or, you know, you see couples who clearly have lived through something together, kind of, they're not watching the band even, they're looking at each other and they're sort of hugging and crying and laughing and dancing and it's intense. Huh. And you've, you've described your fans lovingly as darklings. Mm. What's it like being out on this tour and seeing those darklings grow up, those misfit teenagers grown up? And It's moving, mm-hmm. you know. I mean, we have accumulated a lot of new fans too, thank God. It's not just um, all the, the original fran- fans from 1995. But yeah, I, I recognize a lot of them. And we watch, you know, as they watch us, we're also watching them, you know. And, and we do see them grow up and change and some of them we see bloom and some of them we see go through incredible difficulties and yeah it's it's really it's profound do you have any favorite stories from that fans have maybe shared with you my favorite stories tend to be weirdly enough and i'm not quite sure why but i love the transgender fans who 
when we maybe met them, they were teenagers and you could tell there was some kind of real flux going on in their lives. And then, you know, we've come back and visited them and they're like, they've completely changed gender. Mm. They're much more confident. They're happy. It's just, it's really incredible to see. Uh, let's talk about the origins of the garbage sound for a moment. The distorted electric guitars, dance beats, provocative lyrics. How did that fusion come about? I would love to take credit for that. For the most part, I think that really lies at the, at the, the band's feet and in particular Booch. I think he understood that he had made these records with titans of alternative rock and he couldn't afford really to go up against them in competition in any way, shape or form. So he had to come up with a sound that was different from the bands he'd worked with mm. in case he was accused of plagiarism or I don't know what. And... Uh, also, just there, they have a the the band have a lot of love of um, pop music, and so we we had this alternative rock sort of perspective smattered with all these different styles of music that have that we put together in some haphazard manner, inspired a lot by hip hop records and rap records, actually. Hmm. Let's let's go back to that moment. Um, well, the, the early days, early writing sessions are with Butch Vig, who's produced Sonic Youth and Nirvana and the Smashing Pumpkins, um, and and the rest of the band. You're in a new country with new guys. Yeah. What was that like? I don't know. It was awful, actually. If the truth be told, it was pretty awful. I loved them. They were great, and I had fun. But you know, when you don't know people that well, it's always awkward. And I had no money. I couldn't, you know, we didn't have any di phones back then with no computers. So, I mean, I couldn't really afford to call home. So I was just this freaky, white, you know, red-headed weirdo in, in the, the middle, middle of, of the America. Midwest. <laughs> yeah, it was super intense. Wow. Yeah. I don't recommend it as a way of really forging a new band, if the truth be told, but it worked Especially out with music, because that's quite uh, intimate, vulnerable space. Yeah. So how, how did it work out so well if it was a difficult experience? Well, if you'd met if you met my band, you'd understand why. They're super sweet and they're very gentle. And so I think that was one of the reasons it worked. Because mm. if they have, had been sort of hardcore with me, I think I would have flipped my lid. And, and you, all, you did have some experience under your belt at the same time. I did. I'd been yeah. in a band for almost a decade at that point. So I was, I was well versed in, in being in the studio, making records, I sort of knew what way was up, you know, so mm -hmm. that helped. Your music is often read as a reaction against the macho aspects of grunge and alternative. Mm -hmm. What do you make of that? I think there's some truth to that. I mean, I think, again, because we were, not, we, we were kind of veterans even when we started out, which is hard to believe now, but we, I think we understood we needed to do something unique. We had to have a strong voice or we would be drowned out. So I think we understood that we had to have a point of view. Mm. And, and we, we did have, musically and... And sonically. Sonically, yeah. Uh, according to legend, your first meeting with your bandmates happened on the day that Kurt Cobain was found dead. Yeah, that's true. What effect do you think that had on the formation of the group? Oh, I, I don't know. It was pretty intense. I, I mean, the Nirvana legacy has, you know haunted us in a in a beautiful way our entire career just because Butch made that record with mm -hmm. them and it's played a large role in his life. So that sort of spills into ours. Um, and, you know, Butch obviously continues to work with the Foo Fighters. So there's, a, you know, there's family at this point. It's stayed, there's this connection that's just stayed there. Yeah. yeah. Even yeah. as you just described um, this project almost in response partly to, you know, those great records and trying to do something different to yeah. You know, find a place in the landscape. Uh, your self-titled debut album, massive success, spent over a year on the charts in the U.S. and the U.K., sold uh, four million copies worldwide. Mm -hmm. What did that rush of success feel like at the time? Well, on one hand, it was incredible, you know. I mean, it is incredible when that happens. And we were gleeful and we couldn't believe our luck. But I found a lot of the pressures that came with that kind of a attention difficult to deal with. There was a lot of pressure on me to, you know, look good and dress well. And all of a sudden you're being scrutinized by fashion magazines and the music press. And I, I find that pretty challenging. Even with your experience up to that point, was it still a surprise, that level of scrutiny? Oh, my God, yeah. Because, yeah. I, you know, I was in a band for a decade that had very little success in adverted commas in, in, 
in sort of mainstream terms. You know, I wasn't used to more than 10 people, maybe 20 people coming to a show, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden we're playing sold out shows. I mean, that's intense. And yeah. you can't prepare for that. It's, it's, it's nobody can be prepared for that. What do you think got you through it? Experience, the fact that the band were good people. We were, we were humble for the most part. We didn't allow success to make our heads grow. We, we, were all, we kept each other grounded and we were all determined not to be, you know, a cliche of success. What do you think when you see new artists go through that sort of rush of success? I find it fascinating, of course, you know, because I can really identify with that journey. And it's it's fascinating to see how all the different personalities deal with it. Mm. Do you think some people just, I don't know, what, I don't want to say this, but don't necessarily have the constitution to deal with it? Does it take a certain kind of essential strength? I think it does take a certain constitution, you're right. And, and, and what that is, that bundle of abilities and strengths and, and weaknesses too, um, what that it's difficult to quantify what that is but yeah there's certain characters you can that appear in the music scene and I'm like they will last five minutes they are so over before they've even begun wow I think what you said earlier about having a point of view as an artist is a big thing for dealing with that kind of absolutely success yeah because it helps you if you have a point of view you know that roots you in truth and mm -hmm. you know who you are and you know what you want and because success when it first happens is kind of, it's a free run in a way. It's just a, a zeitgeist moment, you know. But to maintain success, you really have to know where you're going in a funny way because otherwise all the pressures and the expectations of your label and the public will start pushing you around. And then mm -hmm. when you get pushed around, you get you're lost. really in trouble. Yeah, you, get, you lose yourself. One of the biggest songs on that first record was Queer. Back in 1995, it was rare to hear the word queer on mm. pop radio, especially in an empowering sort of context. What sort of a reaction were you hoping for with that song? I don't think we were hoping for a reaction. We were just trying to speak up about things that we cared about. And the LGBT community was always something that was really close to, to my heart to the band's heart. We always believed in civil rights for that community. And we also identified with that sort of outsider status mm -hmm. that um, that community, you know, inhabited back then. We've seen so many changes. It's so phenomenal. But yeah, 1995, it was, yeah. you know, different. Do you feel like enough artists now... Uh, are similar in the sense that they have that point of view, they have um, ideas that they are ready to champion in their music. Do you still see that uh, happening? Uh, it's That's an interesting question. Of course, there are some artists. I mean, the, the two that spring to mind for me would be Lady Gaga and Kanye. Mm -hmm. They both have very strong ideas and opinions and they push them forward and it's exciting to watch. Um, but I think predominantly we're living in an era where people do not attach themselves to any real cause or stand up for anything for fear that they suffer from a backlash or their popularity will be diminished. Why do you think that is? Because I think we're living at a time in our culture where all that ma seems to matter is is how big you are, you know, how successful you are. There's There seems to be very little interest in anything that exists on the sidelines. How many likes, how many views? How many likes, how many views? Um, I want to get into the minutia of the record a little bit. Little known fact, um, instead of sampling James Brown's drummer, Clyde Stubblefield, you guys got Clive Stubblefield on the record. Yeah, he's what was, incredible. What was that like? Well, Clyde is something else. I mean, he's probably a the most legend. sampled drummer, or one of the most sampled. Drummers he is in the, the most sampled, you know, yeah. and you hear him on so many records, and he is the most humble angel musician we have ever had the pleasure of meeting he's phenomenal zero ego just loves to play hmm. and we were so honored to have him on our record it was crazy but he lived in madison you see and he was friendly with the band so we just got lucky amazing yeah uh you mentioned the outsider sympathizing with the outsider how do you maintain that perspective now after you've experienced so much success i think it's easy you know in just that who we are as people you know 
I am a bit of a weirdo. You know, I'm not sort of the most people-pleasing, cheerleading, athletic, pretty, glamorous girl out there. I mean, I've just always been a bit of a weirdo and my band are the same. And so... I, I know, and, we, and as a band, we've never fitted in with any particular scene ever. Mm. So I think it's just our natural state of being, and that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you said earlier, as you've grown up, you've gained confidence. Yeah. But you still feel essentially like a weirdo still. I feel like a weirdo, but that has nothing really to do with my confidence. I mean, my confidence has grown just because I've done the work. You know, I've been doing this now for 20 years. I'm pretty good at it. You do anything for 20 years, you'll find you're pretty good at it. How much was music instrumental in gaining confidence just on a human, personal level for you growing up? It's funny, I never thought of myself as a musician until quite recently, until about eight years ago. I was like, actually, I am a musician and I've been playing music since I was very young. And it's been, it's like my oxygen in a funny way. You know, asking me to live outside of it is like asking a fish to live outside of water. What changed for you to consider yourself a musician? Failure. Failure. Yeah, we failed in terms of we lost our record deals and we had previously been sort of radio's darlings and TV's darlings and the media's darling. We, we endured a, a huge backlash where people were said yeah, they're over, it's over for them, they're no longer you know, of interest to anybody and that was tough to take. But then when somebody tells you that you're no good, you... you you sit in a dark corner and you weep and you do your grieving. And then for me, I was so defiant and I saw so many other artists and bands rise up and, and do the kind of things that we had done, just not as well, hmm. that it, was, it filled me with a determination that surprised me. And I think that's when I accepted, OK, you, you clearly need to do this. You want to do it. You have to do it. That's so interesting because most people would say success is what made them feel like now I'm a musician. You said it was that moment of failure was actually what was pivotal. I think that's when you grow your most is when, you're, when you uh -huh. fail. You know, you either allow it to define you, failure to define you, and you just accept it, or you fight against it. And that, I think that's when you really find the truth of who you are, what you are. What you want. What you want. Garbage emerged um, in an era, sort of a golden era for powerful female voices. PJ Harvey, Courtney Love, uh, you know, Alanis Morissette, to put it in Canadian terms. Yeah, of course. Uh, who, who do you see continuing that tradition today? Well, I mean, the most obvious one would be Gwen Stefani. You know, I mean, she was my peer and we met on the touring circuit and she has enjoyed this incredible career that's just gone from strength to strength to strength. I mean, it's unbelievable. PJ Harvey is also an absolute, like, touchstone for me. She's one of my favourite artists and she continues to do interesting work today. So mm. all these women that you mention are still working musicians and that is so rare. You know, it hardly ever happens for women because we're expected to be young and beautiful. And then when we pass the age of that sort of peak, most, you know, historically speaking, women have been thrown on the garbage pile. And all those women you talk of, all my peers, we've all defied those those sort of restrictions. And I and and I'm. I'm proud of each and every one of us. That's interesting. So the biggest hurdle isn't getting into the music industry. The, the biggest hurdle is longevity I, for, 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 me, fe yeah, for I female think, artists in, in your I opinion. think so, yeah. yeah. I think because anyone really pretty much can enjoy a moment. Especially now. Especially now. But to endure whilst there's 20 years of m other music to, to sort of drown you out... Mm -hmm. It is that takes a certain tenacity, I think, and um, defiance that you don't see all the time. In, in and the culture. reward, at least part of the reward, must be the richness of experience you were describing earlier, seeing these fans like you see now on this tour, having these really rich moments with your music. Yeah, that that's gratifying, but mm. the most magical moments for me are when I'm working in the studio with the band and, and I think, wow, I'm still getting to make music. That's insane. You know, it's still exciting to write a song. That still feels good, you know. Did you think that it would still be exciting 20 years later? Or you just thought you wouldn't be doing it 20 years later? I didn't think I would be doing it 20 years later. And actually, I can remember, I can 
fully remember me saying to people, if I'm singing Stupid Girl at the age of 30, shoot me, you know? So it just shows you, you don't know much when you're young. <laughs> <laughs> I want more life, damn it. <laughs> um, the music industry has obviously changed dramatically since the release of your first album. What's been the biggest adjustment for your band? Well, that's a good question. Um, I mean, the industry itself has not changed. You know, the industry, you know, exists to make money from artists. That's it's very simple. And when you sign a record deal, you're making a deal with the devil. And that's, that's, it's very simple. In terms of how we experience music, I think in some ways that remains the same too. You know, you, somebody hears a song that they identify with and thus a connection is made. But the one thing I do notice that's very different is if you are lucky enough to break into the music scene, then because of the advent of social media, you have a massive distribution tool at your disposal in a way that we didn't in the 90s. And you see these talents utilize those distribution uh, sources in a yeah. way. And those channels. Those really, channels. Yeah. And, and you, can, you can explode in ways that you couldn't back in the day. And you guys have released music independently. Yes, we continue to actually, yeah. yeah. And how's that experience been? Well, it's challenging, you know, because as much as we knock the record labels, the record labels picked up the tab for a lot of stuff. And now we have to pick up the tab ourselves. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm Scottish. I hate doing that. I hate paying, you know, through the nose for all the services that are required to, to put a record out. And yeah. um, because nobody's buying music anymore, that creates a lot of problems for us, you know, to how do, how do we continue to distribute our music whilst, you know, not really making any money from records. Yeah, these profound disruptions have happened in the way that the music business works, but there aren't any clear solutions yet. There's, not yet. Yeah. But it's early days. I mean, I think something will change. I really do believe that. But unfortunately, we're just at this, this little loophole right now where technology is still relatively new that kind of technology anyway. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure somebody somewhere along the line will figure out how to protect the musician. But until then, we just have to make do. It's just how it is. No, no use crying about it. No, no. And, and music will always exist. And people, always. Yeah. yeah. You guys are prepping the release of a new album. We are. What can you tell us about it? Well, it's always difficult to talk about a record until it's mixed and, and it, it remains unmixed. The songs are written. They sit at home waiting for us to come back. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we'll mix them in, in December and January, and it's slated for a spring release. Okay. So we shall see what we shall see. <laughs> I, I like that. Not talking about it until it's mixed. There's no point, right? Yeah. Uh, what's the key to staying inspired 20 years, 20 years into the game? Ooh, I think, again, it's a gift I have that I can refuel on a daily basis. I never go up on stage and feel tired. I never feel, wow, my God, I can't sing this song again. I'm always grateful. I'm always joyful. I understand how lucky we are and privileged we are. I think because I struggled for so long, we all did, in bands where nobody was really that interested, that we, we have taken our opportunity by the throat. Yeah. And we've really worked hard you know and the gratitude is there every day to inspire I, I, you yeah it sounds like such a ghastly cliche but it's true i feel yeah. so lucky i am lucky i know that because i have so many musician friends who've never even enjoyed a fraction of 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 the kind of success i've i've had and it really humbles me so, so much you talked about learning so much um in the last 20 years What's the biggest change in your thinking that's happened, the most sort of profound learning or, or change in your mindset? Uh, well, I am a quite a negative person, funnily enough. I'm, I'm very full of, I'm full of gloom and doom. And I used to allow that to dismantle me completely, you know. And now what I do is I make it inform my day i.e. what I mean by that is like, you know, I used to be like, oh, we're all going to die tomorrow. What's the point in doing anything? Mm -hmm. And I would allow that to depress me. Instead, I've inverted it. And now it's like, yeah, we're all going to die tomorrow. So let's make today amazing. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I guess so. 
<laughs> That's great. Thank you so much uh, for Thank stopping you. by, Thank you. I'm Shirley. so happy to be here in your beautiful city. Thank you.